Hello everyone. Welcome to yet another sessions for the daily news, daily news analysis by Shri Ram's IS, where we take up the important articles featuring in the Hindu newspaper and break them down for to simplify us uh, from the point of view of UPSC examination. With this, let's take up the important articles for today. The important articles which appear on the the daily edition of the Hindu newspaper are on the screens and we have taken the important article. Let's take up the first article that is featuring in the newspaper. The first article that appears in the newspaper talks about the center to boost supply of fortified rice. Now this issue of fortified rice is a much talked about issue in the recent past and we will talk about the process of fortification. What is fortification of rice? What is the issue behind this? and what is the center doing as a step. So this becomes important for us to study from the food security point of view and that is why it becomes important from both GS2 as well as GS3 for us. With this, let's talk about first what do we mean by the process of fortification and what is fortified rice. Then we'll do, uh, then we'll take a look as to what center is doing for it. So. When we talk about fortification, the forti process of fortification means addition of key vitamins and minerals such as iron, iodine, zinc, vitamin A and D to staple foods such as rice, milk and salt to improve their nutritional content. So this means that this step of fortification of or addition of uh, minerals and vitamins to uh, grains such as rice and food stuff substances such as milk and salt is being done to deal with the problem of malnutrition in the country where the availability of food is not sufficient to bridge the gap and the requirement for nutrition for a lot of kids and that is why the center has come up with the idea of fortification of food items wherein in these food items additional vitamins and minerals would be pumped in and in this way the gap of malnutrition will be able to be filled. So the process of fortification is being used for that purpose. So these nutrients are additionally uh, artificially put in uh, in these grains and substances. They are not originally present in the food before processing. So therefore this is the process of fortification and then what is the fortification of rice or what we also called fortified rice. So fortified rice is that rice which is the fortification of rice is done in a cost effective and complementary strategy to increase the vitamin and mineral content in rice. So the normal rice would be mixed with additional uh, vitamins such as according to the FSSAI norms 1 kg of fortified rice will contain additional mixing of iron which is we, which would be 28 milligrams to 42.5 milligrams folic acid will be added which would be around 75 to 125 microgram and vitamin b12 would also be added so this means that normal rice is being added with additional minerals and vitamins to increase the nutritional capacity of the rice right then in addition the rice may also be fortified with micronutrients singly or in combination with zinc, vitamin A, vitamin B1, B2, B3 and B6. So these other minerals and vitamins can also be added to the fortified rice. This is the concept of fortified rice which the center has taken up through a scheme. Now what scheme is this through which they uh, want to fortify the rice and supply it to all the districts of the country. So let's talk about the scheme now. This scheme is known as the newly centrally sponsored pilot scheme. What do we mean by centrally sponsored scheme? There are two types of scheme. One is centrally sponsored and other is central sector. Center sector schemes are those schemes the funding of which is wholly done by the center and centrally sponsored schemes are those schemes 
where the partial funding is done by center and other part of the funding is done by states. So that is the difference between these two types of schemes. So this particular scheme is a centrally sponsored scheme on fortification of rice and its distribution under public distribution system. So the scheme is being handled by the consumer affairs and food and public distribution ministry. Uh, the scheme comes under this ministry. Now under this scheme, the FCI or Food Cooperation of India has been asked to come up with a comprehensive plan for procurement and distribution of fortified rice in all the districts of the country under the Integrated Child Development Services or ICDS scheme and the Midday Meal scheme. This scheme is renewedly known as PM Potion. So, under these two existing schemes, the fortified rice is to be supplied to the uh, midday meal uh, scheme students which would be in schools and under the ICDS program to uh, various kids in all the districts of the country. So, FCI has procured the uh, amount of fortified rice and now the uh, scheme talks about that the first phase is complete where the 90 districts were covered which means that FCI procured the grains fortified rice and states supplied the rice to 90 districts and additionally 29 to uh, 291 districts is the additional target which is set by the ministry to supply the fortified rice and the need for such a step to be done is being touted because malnutrition is being touted as a big problem for the center to handle which in which it, the article says that malnutrition costs rupees 77,000 crore annually. So due to malnutrition loss of nearly 77,000 crore annually happens in terms of lost productivity, illness and death of the uh, kids and individuals in the country. We lose precious human capital right. So, because of the loss of human capital, the loss in terms of monetary basis comes out to be 77,000 crore annually and loss of 1% GDP due to anemia. Anemia is the condition where the body lacks iron content and this is a very prevalent situation in uh, some states especially such as UP and Bihar. So, this is the monetary uh, loss which is faced due to the malnutrition and other allied diseases which get caused due to malnutrition. So, the center wants to uh, diffuse these losses by adding to the nutrition of the kids and individuals through the supply of this fortified rice. But there are a lot of concerns as well with the supply of fortified rice. One can see that tampering with the natural food grains and adding artificially all these nutrients additionally to them can be a cause of concern. The process of doing this has to be very calibrated and it needs to be looked at that the processes are safe and there is no counter effect on the kids and individuals. Apart from that, it is also said by the experts that it is not only iron or other content which is missing in the nutrition palate. There are a lot of other components as well which also we need to take in care of when it comes to the dietary requirements of the kids and this is being labeled as a challenge that only supplying iron or other vitamins to the rice might not fulfill or bridge the gap for malnutrition. But the experts from the side of the government have said that though there can be dangers or uh, certain challenges, the benefits far outweigh the challenges and that is their reason for going ahead with the scheme. Now we'll have to wait and see the performance of the fortified rice and what changes in terms of health and productivity it makes to the population of India, right? With this, let's move on to our next article for the day. The next article comes as a big data point for us, which reads as Russia is now the second biggest oil vendor to India. Now, with respect to the Russia-Ukraine crisis, The crude oil prices have been surging high. We have been looking at a lot of dynamics being changed 
due to the Russia Ukraine crisis. In that crisis, one other thing that also has happened is that Indian refiners bought a lot, bought around 25 million barrels of Russian oil in the month of May available at a deep discount. Now, if the crude oil prices were high due to the crisis, how did the Indian refineries get Russian oil at deep discounts? Because due to sanctions on Russian oil by the Western nations, the Russian oil is available to those countries which want, which are able to or want to buy the Russian oils at deep discount. And this is the benefit that the Indian refiners have taken and they have bought a lot of quantity of Russian oil in the month of May, which has uh, trumped Saudi Arabia as the second largest importer for crude oil in India and Russia now stands at the second, which is the largest uh, import uh, India uh, from which country the India imports the largest amount of crude oil that is Iraq and the, at the second place now comes Russia and at the third place now comes Saudi Arabia from which the countries which we import our crude oil requirements. We have seen earlier that India imports around 85% of its crude oil requirements. Right. So this is this becomes an important data point for us to uh, understand, which can be even asked in the form of a prelims question or can be used as a fodder point for a means answer. With this, let's let's move to our next article. The next article features with the uh, aspect of the NFH, uh, NFHS or the National Family Health Survey. with the context of National Family Health Survey which is conducted by the Indian government, the article talks about what Indians own, wherein the survey that is conducted which takes an account of various parameters of the Indian population about their health, about their productivity, about their resources, so this report has come up with the data of their belongings which gives us an idea of a very vital look at the real condition of the socio-economic conditions of the Indian population. So we'll take a look at this data, what the data says and look at some of the important points about National Family Health Survey. So about the Family Health Survey first, what is the National Family Health Survey? It is a large scale multi-round survey conducted in a representative sample of households throughout India. When we say representative sample of households, it, it means that not all households would be uh, conducted the survey or upon, but a representative sample, a limited number of people who can designate the, or a later can be extrapolated for the entire population, which the, it is meant by representative sample. And which body is it conducted by? The Ministry of Health and Family Welfare has designated the International Institute for Population Sciences or IIPS Mumbai. So the governing body is the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and the institute which conducts the survey is the IIPS Mumbai as the nodal agency for providing coordination and technical guidance for the survey. So this survey collates information or surveys information with respect to the, po uh, the population on a lot of issues with respect to the health parameters, their resources, their belongings that they hold, a lot of things. Now in this uh, article, the point of focus is uh, on their socio-economic conditions. or belongings, which gives us an idea of their standard of living. So the important data that we can extract from the report is that the first data which comes on is with respect to the vehicle. Now we know that the sign of owning of a vehicle 
talks a lot about the conditions of the population. So what does the first point say is that for the whole country around 49.7% of the total population own a motorized two-wheeler which means that around 50% households of the country own at least a two-wheeler. This is the national average and the map of India shows the density of the vehicle owning wherein the darker the shade more is the number of vehicles owned by the population and lighter the shade less is the number of vehicles owned. So we can see that the western part such as Rajasthan, Haryana, Punjab, Gujarat, MP, Maharashtra they are owning more than 50% the uh, households are there which own a two wheeler and the number is quite low in the Jammu and Kashmir or Ladakh region and the northeast region. This can also be a factor towards the geography of the region where the terrain of northeast and Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh is not very uh, is very rugged and that is why that can also be one of the reason for the less number of two wheelers owned and also the economic conditions of the population. So this kind of data can give, a, give us an idea about a lot of things. So this was with respect to the two wheelers. Now with respect to the share of four wheelers or a car. So even now the share of households which own a car is only at about 7.5% as the national average which means that only 7.5% population of India own a car. This is a quite a low number for the owning of a car which again puts a lot of light on the economic conditions of the uh, population of the country. So again the uh, highest number of four wheelers can be looked at and it is spread evenly in the country. Right? The next data is talking about a bicycle or a, a share of states who do not own any of the three which means that share of households which do not own a car, bike or a bicycle. This shows again a very big spotlight on the economic conditions which means that 24.7% population of the country is such that they do not hold any of this, a car, a bike or a bicycle, right? So this is also an important data from which observations can be made. This is the data pertaining to the vehicle owned by the population. Now with respect to the everyday appliances which exist. So everyday appliances which can also be talked about such as the television, refrigerator and washing machine. So those households which own all the three appliances, the share of households which own all three appliances that is the television, refrigerator and washing machine are a mere 16% of the total population, right? With the highest density being in the region of Punjab, Haryana, Himachal Pradesh and Jammu and Kashmir. These are the households which own all three appliances, right? So this data becomes very useful to uh, garner micro points about the socio-economic conditions of the population and we can cite this data wherever required in the mains answer as well as the points about uh, National Family Health Survey can be asked in the prelims examination. With this, let's move on to our next article for the day. The next article which appears in the newspaper talks about the upholding the right to repair. Now, the right to repair is a crucial concept being discussed not just in India but also in the world over and developments are happening wherein the US state of New York recently passed the Fair Repair Act which requires manufacturers to supply repair information and parts to independent repair shops. So the US state of New York has passed a law in the context of right to repair. We will first try to understand what exactly is the right to repair, what is the status or arguments for this right to repair, what are the problems occurring for it and what can be done. So first of all we can understand what is the right to repair. When we say the right to repair what do we mean? This means that 
we can see a lot of times that the technology or the ele electronic equipment that you that we are using we uh, a lot of times this is happening that they are short lived so that we buy the equipment from the manufacturer and it it gets defunct in a particular period of time and if it gets defunct earlier we are forced to buy a new equipment from the manufacturer uh, uh, manufacturer again what this does is this gives the manufacturer a monopoly of calling the consumer back as in when it wants to call him him or her back and thus impede upon the right of the consumer to fully own the product and also to repair the product what happens is that the consumer when he or she has bought the product does not has have the right to repair wherein the manufacturer comes with a clause and says that if the uh, if appliance is damaged or defunct only the manufacturer has the right to repair it and if the consumer tries to repair the product with any other third party the obligation to ask for any warranty would be lapsed so all of these conditions hamper upon the right to repair of the individual wherein he or she or who is the consumer of the product does not have full ownership of that product and a lot of monopoly lies to the manufacturer and to combat this is the movement of right to repair where the full ownership and the right to repair the product by uh, themselves or through a third party should be granted to the consumer so what is the right to repair it is a right to give users and third party companies the required tools parts and manuals related to a product this would enable them to repair a product on their own instead of depending on the manufacturers the right to repair movement traces its root back to the very dawn of the computer era in the 1950s so i hope the right to repair concept is clear the rationale behind the movement is that individual who purchases a product must be own must be able to own it completely this implies that apart from being able to use the product consumers must be able to repair and modify the product they want to right so this is a very crucial thing with respect to a lot of uh, aspects so we'll try to discuss what is the need or what are the arguments that are in favor for the right to repair so what are the reasons to provide right to repair there can be a lot of reasons first is the pricing the absence of repair manuals means that manufacturer holds holds near monopoly over repair workshops that charge consumers exorbitant prices this happens right if the uh, onus of repairing the product lies only with the manufacturers when the consumer goes to the manufacturer for repair the manufacturer can charge any amount of fees that he or she wants to that is why high pricing to combat high pricing right to repair is important and then tackle planned obsol obsolescence it is what i was talking about where planned obsolescence is a policy where the product is made in such a manner that it is, that the life of the product is short lived so that the product is used very early and the need for a new product is also uh, uh, arisen very quickly this concept is known as planned obsolescence where the manufacturers deliberately make a short lived product right After, where the policy is for producing consumer goods that become obsolete after a certain period of time therefore consumers have to buy the new product once the existing product becomes unusable it is achieved by frequent changes in design termination of the supply of spare parts and the use of non durable materials so due to all of these things and to combat this tactic used by the manufacturers the importance of right to repair is quite high the another reason is to right to choose now why must only the manufacturer hold the right to repair the consumers should have a right to choose on repair processes and therefore when they do not get the choice it infringes the customer's right to choose recognized by the consumer protection act so their right to choose also gets impacted and therefore right to repair is a supplement to the right to choose and through this right to repair if we uh, 
consider it also boosts local economy because apart from the manufacturers who held the monopoly to repair the product other third party local shops if they also get a chance to repair the product it boosts the local economy as well and it allows the opening of small repair shops in the local area that adds to the revenue of the region and creates sufficient employment as well so this is also a point for right to repair and one other important reason is the environmental protection a lot of in the previous sessions as well we have dealt with electronic waste and therefore if one manufacturer keeps on producing short lived products for profit it takes a huge toll on the environment where each electrical equipment is made with harmful chemicals and metals and that is why right to repair also is a attack towards uh, protecting the environment and attacking the manufacturers on uh, stopping them from polluting the environment this way so these are the points which can be cited for the provision of incorporating right to repair but are there certain reservations as well there are certain arguments uh, against right to repair which are furthered by the manufacturers what are they their central argument is that the large tech companies including apple microsoft amazon and tesla have argued that opening up the intellectual property to the third party repair services or amateur repairers could lead to the exploitation and impact the safety and security of the devices so they have they make an argument that the superior quality of the product if they if they make uh, other people eligible to repair that product the quality of their product might go down and the intellectual property which they developed with great uh, effort and skill can be hampered as their safety and security if they uh, disclose this to other people so that is a point of reservation which the uh, manufacturers use as a point for opposing right to repair but and therefore what can be the way forward with this issue is that both uh, stakeholders rights the consumers as well as the manufacturers are important and therefore balancing of the rights of the consumers and manufacturers is important now how can we balance all the concerns that can be raised by the manufacturers such as to protect the intellectual uh, property rights and to make sure that the quality of the product is kept intact certain measures can be taken such as the companies themselves can send their spare parts to uh, certified shops recommended shops where apart from them these other shops who are certified by them can also uh, take the task of repair that can solve the problem of quality and a non disclosure agreement for the ip protection can be signed with these sh shops which takes care of the problem of dissemination of intellectual property in fact france in its new law also mandates to provide repairability index to the consumers wherein the manufacturers in the packaging of the product have to assign repairability index to the product whether or not which means that there are certain levels at which the manufacturers need to provide whether this product is repairable non repairable partially repairable this is the repairability index which falls under the uh, right to be informed under the consumer protection act this has been done by france which can also be taken as a example to learn so these are some points with respect to right to repair where we saw what exactly is the right to repair what is the need for it what are some of the concerns that the manufacturers are making and how there is a way forward with uh, innovative uh, practices to balance the rights of both consumers and manufacturers with this we come to the end of today's session we'll meet again with tomorrow's important articles of the day thank you